First, if you don't mind, can I ask you about the masterclass that you're doing through Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp? Sure, you can ask me anything you like. The most I can do is say no, or <laughs> I don't know, or I plead the fifth, or whatever. Exactly. Well, the class that you're doing through Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp is a master class. And of course, you're one of the survivors of rock and roll. Do you have a format in mind for this class, or is it you'll talk and then take questions? Um, well, I've done, I did one once before and I, I didn't really do a whole lot of talking. I, I mean, people have so many questions that we just kind of went right to that. Uh, there was a lot of questions about the book because the, um, the irony of the book is that, um, um, my book was released the same day that Michael Jackson died. And so it got so caught in the media shuffle that it, it really had no life at all. And so uh, as a result of that, it's still around and there's still people asking questions about it and there's still people reading it, you know, 10 years later. Um, and I'm thinking about uh, working on another form of either a book or a podcast or something Um also, again, with uh, Keith, who is the guy that Keith Gard, who's the guy that co-wrote the book with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been, you know, we've been friends for 30 years. And so he knows my story. He knows all about me. And uh, he helped me write the book. And um, the thing that remains interesting about the book, uh, which I'm kind of proud of, is the fact that... Um, the, the content of the book and the, and the, the uh, subject matter in the book is such that um, it will never really go away. It'll always be relevant mm -hmm. because subject and the subject matter in the book is about stuff that we're still talking about today. Only I was talking about it 10 years ago and still today, you know, um, alcoholism, drug addiction, anxiety, depression, just living life on life's terms, um, spiritual awakenings, things that, that went on. And those kind of things are still being talked about all the time. So there's no shelf life for the book. Right. You know, and um, people are still enjoying it. And, and you know, and my, my outlook on it is, is that if I can help, if I help one or two people, then, it, then it, I, I accomplish my goal. When the book came out, I read through it in two days, and it was an inspirational tale. You cleared up a lot of myths. You obviously have a different recollection from some of your bandmates. I think that you, between you and me and everybody hearing and or reading this, I think you have a better recollection <laughs> than some of your peers do. But well, yeah, most, most of what most of what um, of what everybody else's book is. Um, not, not just not just my partners, but all all the guys in all the bands that have written books. It was kind of like a trend for a while there, you know. But I took about four or four and a half years to write that book. Yeah, because it wasn't just about you know drugs and girls and you know the usual shit that goes on backstage and you know because I, I didn't find it all that interesting. Of course, that's in there. Because it was part of my life, but essentially, right. what the book is is it's you know it's the story of my life, and in, in which the band is inclusive of so, so that a lot of the band is in there and different uh, things that happened and events that went down, um, but the other sub the rest of the subject matter that's in the book is all stuff like I said that's still you know relevant today. Yeah, people that, are, that people are still dealing with whether it's anxiety or drugs or addiction or alcoholism or whatever. Yeah. It's just life. It's, it's just, just life. life. And a lot of people, excuse me, are under the impression that if you get to live the kind of life that I've lived or am living, um, that those kind of things don't happen. And, um, and I was there to tell them and let them know that, you know, any, it can happen to anybody. Yeah, you don't have you don't have to be a rock and roll star to crash and burn, and 
all, all things are relevant for all people. And I got a lot of reaction from people all over the world, Russia, Japan, Europe, about how kids related to the fact that <clears throat> because they found out about me and my book and what it was about, mm -hmm. that, that um, it, it gave them it, it, it's inspiration. It inspired them to be able to, you know, put their heads down and, and bull, bully through it. Not bully through it, but you know, plow through it. Bulldoze so through it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and there's a stream of, or a thread rather, uh, that runs through the book, which is uh, the the difference between love and abuse, mm -hmm. which is a very confusing issue for a lot of people, including myself. Because for a long, long time, for many years of my life, I confused love and abuse. Mm -hmm. So the confusion between love and abuse is really the culprit for a lot of people's, <clears throat> what they think are problems, um, which can be fixed if you have the intestinal fortitude. And so I just chose to write about it because I wanted to help people out. You know, I like making people happy. That's why I do what I do. That's why I am what I am, and I will continue to do it until I can't do it anymore. And, you know, the amount of joy that I realize that we have, as a band have brought to people and the amount of recognition and, and, um, and reason for me to do what I'm doing is uh, from that, from yeah. wanting to bring joy to people's lives. And being able to do that is just, you know, it's a pretty amazing feeling. And, yeah. you know, I can't really explain what it's like to be on stage <clears throat> in front of 25 or 30 or 50,000 people. You know, there's nothing quite like it. <laughs> and uh, I'll continue to do it until I can't do it anymore. Well, that ties into something that I find very intriguing about your book, because it largely focuses on the obstacles that you face and all that. But as somebody who's been listening his whole life to Aerosmith, like many, many people, uh, one thing that I've noticed about Aerosmith is the band was the first or the second to do just about every single thing. If, for example, if we talk about Project, or I'm sorry, Revolution X, the video game, Journey had a video yep. game before you, but you guys are the first that really have your music in a video game. The hip hop right. collaboration with Run DMC and embracing hip hop as being more than just a trend. The roller coaster. I don't remember any other bands having a roller coaster before you guys. How much of that was you guys sticking around going, we want to be the first versus just dumb luck of people going, here's an idea? Um, <clears throat> I think that everything is a little bit of everything. So it, you know, it, it may have been a little bit of dumb luck. I don't like, I don't like the connotation of dumb luck, but, um, we enjoyed being on the cutting edge with a lot of different things that we did. Um, Run DMC is a rap band, not a hip hop band. And your pronunciation of my band is incorrect. <laughs> It's Aerosmith, not Ar Aerosmith. is a book that was written, and the story is nothing like it. Well, I don't so have the Yonkers accent some... like you. I'm so sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I'm just giving you some shit. It brings humor to the interview. New York to New York. I totally get it. Yeah, we're about to New York for you, man. Long Island, New York, where you have played many a times at uh, Jones Beach yeah, and Nassau Coliseum. I grew up in, in Westchester, in Yonkers. Yes, you did, and I know that from reading your book. Yeah. So uh, it, it was New Yorkers. Exactly. So it's really great to to speak with you because I've been a longtime fan, and I've admire a lot of the choices that you've made. And a lot of people in your position would go, "I am in one of the biggest bands of all time. I'm just going to do nothing when I'm touring when I'm when I'm not touring, rather." But you launched a successful coffee company. Years ago, um, when did you first get into coffee? Uh, I've been into, I've been a coffee drinker and lover as far as I can, as far back as I can remember. And my wife Linda and I were walking down the street in Italy mm -hmm. when we were once, 
And I was becoming very frustrated because I looked at her and I said, you know, here we are in Italy and I still can't get what I consider to be a really, really great cup of coffee. And she looked at me as she sometimes does with that, you know, certain look that your partner gives you and says, well, why don't you do something about it? And I said, like what? Open a coffee company? She said, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, to make the long story short, here I am like six or seven or eight years later. And yeah, I have a coffee company. I love coffee. I, I always have. Um, I put it out there because it's my favorite coffee and people like it as well. And um, I, I had no idea what I was getting myself into, you know, and, um, and uh, little did I realize that coffee is the second largest traded commodity in the world. Mm -hmm. The only thing they trade more of than coffee is oil. And so I got into it, and I dove, as I have a tendency to do, I dove in head first uh, with all, all eyes and ears open. And um, it's been okay. You know, it's, you know, people love the coffee, and that's my number one goal, is for people to love the coffee and for it to bring them pleasure and joy. And so as far as that's concerned, um, you know, my goal was accomplished with the coffee company. As far as doing other things, you know, as opposed to doing nothing on my in my time off, excuse me, um, I indulge myself in uh, cars. I've always been a car nut since I'm a little kid. And uh, from the time I was eight or ten years old, I couldn't wait to buy my first Corvette and drive and have a great time. And I've been doing that ever since. And I just love cars and coffee and my band and my wife <laughs> and those are the things that kind of keep me busy i don't i just find that um over the years especially as, as i get older i have less and less time for bullshit you know I just, i'm just i'm too old i just can't deal with um stuff that's not real anymore or drama or bullshit um there's just there's no room or time for it yeah and in terms of side projects, I know from doing my research that you played in the short-lived band Renegades. You have you're a drummer. Period. Now I find that just about every Hall of Fame legendary rock drummer I can think of has a local combo that they play with, whether or not it's publicly advertised. Like Mick Fleetwood has his band in Maui that he just gets up on stage and plays with. Is there a secret Joey Kramer band? Oh. <laughs> Um, as far as what I play in or as far as what I listen to or as far as just what I like? I would say both. Like uh, another example would be the producer, Bob Rock. People who hung out with yeah. him in Hawaii know that he has that secret country band that just plays at a no-name bar. Do you have something yeah. like that? Yeah, I know Bob and, and um, we've worked on records together. Yeah. Some of Aerosmith's records we did, we, we're done with Bob Rock. Um, and I... Um, don't really have well renegade you know was almost almost came to be we were doing the basic tracks for an album when um certain people decided that they wanted to see this band come back together yes and of course that's got to be first and foremost and so that's what we did and so um you know renegade never really came to be although it was a it was a pretty good band it was me tom was playing bass. Uh, Bobby Mayo, who was uh, Peter Frampton's right hand guy, right. And a, guy, a guy that I grew up with when I was a kid, sang and played guitar and piano. And Jimmy Crespo played uh, lead guitar. And Marge Raymond was the singer. And, uh, you know, the tapes are still around. I still have them. And, you know, every once in a while I'll dig them out and listen to them. And it was a fun thing. Um, it, it, it's so difficult now. And that was that was a long time ago as well. Mm -hmm. it was, I mean, that was in the mid '80s, I think. Yeah, early but, '80s. But it's so difficult to try and do that now. You know, like I have great admiration for a guy like like Dave Grohl, for instance. You know, who was in his band Nirvana, and then took it upon himself to go and do what he's doing now and have 
himself his own successful career. Kudos to him, man. I, I have large respect for the guy. He's a great drummer. He's a great guitar player. He's, I don't really know him, but from what I understand, he's a really nice guy, a great person. And um, that's great. You know, I don't, uh, I don't have that myself. I come from uh, the land of rhythm and blues. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I do a lot of listening, but most of the listening that I do is to that stuff. You know, I don't, I, I have a, I have a very difficult time relating to certain things now, nowadays that's called music. <laughs> well said. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm an old school guy and, a lot of the stuff that I like, like my favorite band in the world is Tower of Power. Sure. You probably, I don't even know if you've heard of them. Are you kidding me? Come I've, on, I've Joey. <laughs> I've been listening to them for years and years. And uh, they're, they're my favorite band. And, you know, James Brown, Earth, Wind & Fire, um, stuff like that is, is, is the kind of stuff that I love. Um, as far as my influences go, which you didn't ask me, but I'm going to tell you. Anyway. <laughs> <clears throat> um, when I was growing up, I was listening to um, Mitch Mitchell yeah. from Jimi Hendrix, a guy named Clive Bunker, who played with the original Jethro Tull band and Ian Anderson, um, Dino Dinelli from the Young Rascals. Oh, yeah. Uh, Bernard Purdy, who played on any number of records that were hits and the Motown hits. Yeah. <clears> the <throat> 70s, 80s, um, of course, John Bonham, and of course, the one and only Buddy Rich, who has had an impression. John Bonham and, and Buddy Rich, I think, are probably the two most influential players to, to complete the circle uh, with anyone. Any, any drummer that, has, that doesn't know that he's been influenced by John Bonham or, or, or uh, Buddy Rich is just unconscious. <laughs> because those, those two guys have, yeah, they, they've changed the face of drumming in in both genres, and um, and me included. You know, I, yeah. I I look at so much soul music and so much rhythm and blues um, that that's what was make that that's what was impressing me at the time. And then when the Zeppelin came out, I heard John Bonham play for the first time, and I was just, holy shit, this is what it's about. Yeah. So I took like all the soul music I was listening to and the rhythm and blues and put that kind of a feel to it. Although I can't say that. I mean, you know, he's the master and he always has been. He always will be. There's no one on the face of the earth that plays the drums the way John Bond did. In terms of feel, I'm a feel player and that's what I do. I'm self-taught. I'm from the street and that's where my playing comes from. And, you know, the combination of his feel and my rhythm and blues background is what I am today. You know, I just, Tower Power and James Brown, I just love that shit. It just, it moves me. You're not the only one. <laughs> yeah. No, I know. And it makes for great inspiration. Uh, so those are my influences. And um, on with the questions. <laughs> oh, do you have time for more questions? I want to be very mindful of your time here. Sure. No, I, you, you go ahead. You're fine. Okay. This thing I haven't been able to figure out. Uh, if you dig deep enough, it'll say Joey Kramer, a Jewish rock drummer, blah, blah, blah. Were you bar mitzvahed? As a matter of fact, I was. I was. Um, only because I was born into my mother's household as a little Jewish fellow. Uh, other than that, I know nothing about it. I'm not a practicing Jew. I don't know. I mean, I was born a Jew. That's why it is what it is. Other than that, as far as all those books concerned where I'm mentioned and this and that, I don't have any idea. I'm totally in a fog. It happens. So I'm <laughs> what you would call a practicing Jew. Um, I'm, not, I'm not anything, really. I don't really believe in any kind of I believe in the, that I have a higher power and that that's a, a power that's greater than myself. Um, and I believe that is the love that comes from all people together. We're in it together. 
Um, but as far as religion goes, I, I'm, I'm no one voice. Well, then two softball questions and then you're a free man. And the first one is, is there anything in your career you haven't yet done that you're still hoping to do? Oh. Let's come back to that one. Okay. And then the other one that I have, absolute softball here, but you're one of those people who's remained very mysterious over the years because it's not like I go on social media and go, oh, what's Joey eating for breakfast today? <laughs> you're not one of those kinds of guys. What's your favorite TV show of the moment? Because everyone's watching more TV than usual these days. TV show? Yeah. Oh. Uh. Um, God, I don't know. You know, um, I absolutely did the shit out of Tyler Perry. I think that he's uh, a genius. I think that his work is just the, some of the best that's out there. And my favorite show at the moment is called Ruthless, which is a Tyler Perry show. Um, that's, you know, that there's, there's a new episode on every Thursday night. And um, it's it's intense. You have to just watch it in order for me to. I can't explain it to you, but it's it's really good. Yeah, it's my, really good. My interview right before you was an actress from his show called The Oval, and the key is that oh, guy. That's the best, next best show. Well, the the guy who plays the president actually took guitar lessons under Joe Satriani, so you never know. He might be a diehard fan of yours. Yeah. Well, the Oval is, uh, have you ever seen it? Yes. It's, <laughs> it's really, really good. Um, there's, there's a couple of characters on there that, um, um, especially the president's wife, the first lady. That's who I was interviewing <laughs> right before you that, came on more. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, she plays the best nasty bitch I have ever seen on TV. I mean, she's a, she is really good. I mean, the, everybody that's on that show is good. It's a great show. But uh, if I had to round it down to two, it would be Ruthless and um, The Oval. My wife and I watch those two religiously. So you are a Tyler Perry guy. I had no idea. And Oh, yeah. And Tyler then. Perry. And he's also uh, friends with a friend of mine, a guy by the name of Joel Osteen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In Joel Texas. Joel. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's. I was. I was at the. I was at the church. Uh, he has uh, Lakewood Church here in here in Houston, and I don't know if you know anything about it, but Lakewood sure. Church used to be. Used to be. Well, we played there back in the day. Yes, it's a seventeen thousand seat facility, and it's Joel's church, and I I go there um, when he has a really interesting guest speaker. And Tyler Perry was there one night and Joel invited me down and it was just, he was spectacular. Tyler Perry is just like, I mean, his whole story, you know, about how he came to be and came about and, and, and plowed through all the bullshit yeah. um, is, is so relative and so important, uh, you know, and he's just such a, in my eyes, an amazing human being. Plus, not to mention what he does, his, his work is is outstanding can't prolific. say enough good shit about tyler curry prolific gentleman <laughs> yes he is and, yes he and the question coming back to you about what there is still left to to accomplish the answer might be well oh, take it one day at a time but i didn't know if you were going to say well my goal is to one day have that joey kramer solo album where everyone finally gets to see that i'm a great singer and uh, I get to play with all the musicians that inspired me as well. Um, you know, this might really surprise you, but I really don't have, um, uh, I don't know that I have, I, I haven't really questioned it seriously to, at this point, but I don't know that I really have the desire in me to do a solo album. You know, there's too many other things that I, would like to get involved with um, in terms of people, helping people, and just being a positive influence on Lord knows what we need today, the way the world is. You know, I, I, I feel for us all. And it's really, um, 
it's tragic. I mean, I can't even watch the news anymore, and we won't even go there because that's another conversation. But um, there, are, there are too many other things I think that I would rather get involved in than more music. I don't feel as though I have anything to prove to anyone other than myself. Um, and uh, as far as doing things, you know, I just really enjoy being involved with people and um, helping out and doing what I can do and bringing to the table what I can. And, uh, I, you know, I don't know really specifically what that may be, but when you say one day at a time, that's how I try and live my life one day at a time. Cause I'm, I, you know, I, 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 I've been in recovery for many, many years and, um, that's how I like to live my life. And that's enough of a challenge in itself to, uh, keep me going. Well, to recap our conversation, you have the masterclass coming up next week. The book, we might see a revised edition or a podcast or something from you soon. The coffee company is growing. You're staying really busy, and it's really great to see that you got that drive, whether it's behind a drum kit or not. Oh, yeah, man. I even, you know, I, I'm like, I'm in the gym every other day, even though there's no nothing going on. And, and, uh, you know, I love to, I just go up into my little room. I, I don't have any studio or anything in my house. I have just a little purple room that I love. And it's just me and my drums and my music. And, you know, if I feel like playing with Tower Power. I just put that on. And I love to just sit down and play, you know, with music uh, that I admire. And uh, that, that, that kind of keeps me happy. Well, I'm looking forward to that master class and can't thank you enough for your time. Looking forward to seeing you live in New York and whatever form that is in the near future, man. Well, thank you, Darren. Outro cast.